All right. So I think enhancement is, is a topic that really captures people's imaginations. Um, we, we all have an interest of being more intelligent, being more attractive, or having better physical abilities. Uh, and it's a, a topic that gets a lot of attention in the media and in films and literature. Uh, so a film a couple of years ago investigating this called Gatka looked at the, the effects of using gene editing to bring about a society where people were all enhanced. Uh, a more recent film called uh, Limitless, a character of, um, with Bradley Cooper, um, discovering a pill that could radically transform his abilities and he gets himself into all sorts of problems with that. But it's of course something that humans have been doing for a very long time. We've improved our abilities in various ways, um, often through quite conventional and banal ways, right? So we've improved our education, our nutrition, our healthcare, and we've also developed various kinds of external aids um, to help us achieve the things we want to do. Uh, these include, of course, the, the stone tools of our ancestors, but also the pen and paper and, of course, today, computers. Now, interestingly, we, we've also used a number of biological interventions to achieve uh, improvements in our abilities. Today, of course, people still use caffeine to improve their cognitive functioning on a fairly regular basis. I am certainly one of those people. So assuming that all of these practices have been acceptable, it seems that the main ethical question about enhancement isn't just whether we should seek to improve our abilities, because we clearly do do that. Rather, the question is, are there some ways of doing that which are morally unacceptable? And today we're, of course, witnessing various technologies um, arising which could potentially radically alter our abilities. These include neurostimulation, artificial intelligence, and gene editing. So that's what I want to be investigating in our discussion today. And now many people object to the use of particularly biological interventions to improve human abilities. And that's going to be the main focus of what I'm going to talk about for the next 10 minutes or so. But in order to dig into some of the ethical questions about that, I think we first have to get a bit of a handle about what an enhancement actually is. And, and that in itself is quite a thorny philosophical issue. So this first slide might look a little complicated. Don't worry, I'm going to talk us through it very um, uh, in a fair bit of detail. So hopefully we'll, we'll be able to understand this. So. I think in the debate about enhancement, it's often very tempting to say, well, medical therapies are okay. We can use biological interventions to cure people, but we shouldn't make them better than well. We shouldn't use medicine to enhance people. And that seems very plausible intuitively. Um, and it requires that we can draw this hard and sharp distinction between what is a therapy and what is a, a, um, an enhancement. Now, one way you can do that is to say, well, look, a therapy aims to treat disease. It aims to restore the healthy functioning of a capacity to a normal level, whereas an enhancing intervention aims to improve upon normality. And you might think that that's enough to answer the moral questions. I want to dig into that in a little more detail, though, because, of course, that approach means that we need to have some understanding of what is normality here. How do we understand normal range? How do we distinguish health from disease? Here's one very prominent approach um, amongst the people who talk about this um, topic of enhancement. So you might say we should define the normal range for some trait as the range of values that lies within two standard deviations above and below the mean. What does that mean? Well, let's look at this um, graph now. So this is a graph of a standard distribution of a trait within a population. It doesn't really matter what trait in the minute, it's just the, the distribution that matters. Now, what this definition suggests is that we should understand the normal range as lying between these areas. So two standard deviations above and below the mean. So if you score in this range, then you're in the normal range. If you score above it or below, then you're outside the normal range. And indeed, if you score below it, we might classify you as having a disease or disability. Let me make that even more concrete with an example. So IQ is defined in such a way that the mean score of the population will be 100. So what does that mean on this approach? Well, it means that the upper bound of the normal range will be an IQ of 130. Oops, sorry, clicked on that. Um, whereas the lower bound, will be an IQ of 70, 
So if you fall below an IQ of 70 on this approach, you might be defined as having an intellectual disability. Let's move back to enhancement though. What does this mean for enhancement? Well, let's suppose completely artificially that we had a drug that could increase a person's IQ by five points. Now let's suppose we have a person, let's call him Alex, who has an IQ of 68. So Alex would qualify as having an intellectual disability on this approach because he falls below that lower bound. However, if we give him the drug, it improves him by five points and he would move in to this normal range. That will qualify as a therapeutic intervention. However, let's suppose we've got another person. Let's call him Ben. Now, Ben has an IQ of 80. So it falls below at, uh, the average, the mean, but Ben is within the normal range. Crucially, though, if we give Ben the pill to boost him by five IQ points, on this approach, that will qualify as an enhancement because Ben was already in the normal range to begin with. So that is one very prominent way in which people try to approach the question of enhancement. We should allow therapy, but we shouldn't allow enhancement. But I hope that example makes you think of some reasons to be skeptical of that approach. It seems somewhat arbitrary to say that Ben has been enhanced, but Alex has been um, given a therapy. We might think that it's relatively arbitrary to suggest that we should define the normal range by appealing to these standard deviations. We could define the normal range much more narrowly just by reference to um, one deviation, one standard deviation. So some people would reject this normal functioning approach and say, look, enhancement just is anything that serves to improve our traits um, in any way. I'm not going to go into too much more detail about that because it gets quite complicated, but I think it's a useful lens for which to think about the ethics of enhancement. What is it that makes enhancement so much um, different than a therapy? So what are some reasons we might want to enhance? Well, as I've suggested, we already employ a wide range of non-biomedical conventional modes of enhancement. Um, so there's, of course, a question of why biological interventions should be different. We might also think that enhancements could increase our well-being. So the reason that many people are interested in the use of biological interventions that might improve their cognitive function, for example, is because they think it might help them to do the things they want to do. And finally, there's a general presumption in liberal societies that individuals should be free to make their own choices about how to live their lives, as long as those choices don't harm others. Now, of course, that final argument doesn't necessarily have application when we are talking about enhancing children or indeed using gene editing to perform enhancements prenatally. Um, so not all of, the uh, of these arguments are relevant across the range of enhancements, but they're relevant considerations for some. Okay, in the second half of what I want to say, um, I'm going to give a whistle-stop tour of some of the key objections to enhancement. And there's a huge literature on this, so this really is a, a flavour to prompt our discussion. But I think it's useful to categorise objections to enhancement into two categories. The first we might call empirical objections. So these objections are empirical because they rely on assumptions about contingent features of either enhancements themselves or the societies in which they might be deployed. So the first empirical objection concerns safety and effectiveness. Many of the enhancement technologies that we might currently think about have not been very well studied and it's far from clear whether they would work or whether it would be safe for people to use them. That's of course extremely relevant today. Um, there's been a lot of discussion about gene editing and there has been very little um, study about the safety of gene editing in humans. So it's, of course, a huge, huge moral reason not to think about using gene editing to enhance humans today. But as the technology progresses and the safety concerns evaporate as our technology improves, we will have to confront this moral question, regardless of concerns about safety. A second concern is that the use of enhancements could exacerbate inequalities. So if they're made available only for the rich, this will serve to increase the disparities between the rich and poor. Again, a hugely relevant concern, but it rather depends on how we as a society choose to implement enhancements. In fact, it's true of any technology that can improve people's well-being or their abilities. We have to choose whether we want to make those technologies available to people based on their ability to pay, whether governments might have a reason to subsidize their use. 
it's also worth noting that some enhancements can be pretty cheap, um, some biological enhancements. So I've recently been working on the use of neurostimulation uh, in elite athletes. Uh, and it's worth noting that the kinds of devices that elite athletes are interested in, in using are only really about a couple of hundred pounds. Um, and in comparison, some of the non-biological interventions that elite athletes use can cost many tens of thousands of pounds, and they're not necessarily banned by doping authorities. So it's important to place this concern about equality into the context of what kind of enhancements we're talking about. The final empirical concern um, is whether the use of enhancements might become the new normal, whether people might be coerced into feeling they have to use enhancements. Again, that seems quite plausible. If you're going into a job interview and you know that everyone else has taken a pill that is going to improve their concentration for the next half an hour, you might feel that you're at a significant disadvantage if you don't do so as well. But it is an empirical assumption. There could well be non-competitive contexts in which this social coercion might not occur and where enhancements might be beneficial. And we might also question whether coercion is always necessarily a bad thing. So we often employ professional standards um, which involve a degree of coercion. We expect surgeons to wash their hands before performing a surgery. Would it be so different to expect them to take a pill which will improve their concentration to avoid mistakes in a surgery? I'm not suggesting it is, but it's a question worth thinking about when we talk about uh, this concern about the new normal. And more broadly, new technologies always introduce forms of social pressure. The question is whether that is enough to outweigh the potential benefits of those technologies. Okay, so a second category of objections doesn't rely so much on empirical assumptions, rather they are what we might call in principle objections. So there is something just intrinsically wrong with using biological interventions to enhance human abilities. Now, a prominent theme amongst these objections is that enhancement threatens to transgress upon human nature, and there are various ways in which that might be cashed out. Here's the most um, simple version of it, if you like, um, provided by Francis Fukuyama, the idea that biotechnology will in some way cause us to lose our humanity. But here are some things to think about when you, you ponder that question. The first is, well, what is our humanity? What actually constitutes our human nature? Uh, human nature is in fact a highly ambiguous concept and it's quite difficult to pin down a definition upon which we'll all agree and even if we can agree upon that definition are we always sure that enhancement will serve to alter it that might be true of quite radical technologies such as gene editing or artificial intelligence um, but again using uh, a pill to improve your concentration for half an hour such as modafinil it's unclear whether that would really transgress our human nature and the final point, of course, is that might not necessarily be a bad thing. There are some parts of our human nature which aren't necessarily good. Uh, our human nature was forged in the crucible of evolution, and that might mean that it's fairly well set up to ensure our genes are passed down the generations, but it doesn't necessarily mean that we'll have a very good time while that's happening. So we might want to try and improve upon human nature if that can improve our well-being to avoid the lives of human nature being nasty, brutish, and short, as Thomas Hobbes would have us think. Two more, and then we'll open up the discussion. Um, maybe the problem isn't about undermining human nature per se, but the attitude that enhancement expresses. So Michael Sandel, an American professor, wrote in his book, The Age of Perfection, that the problem with enhancement is that it threatens our ability to appreciate the given, our ability to recognize that our talents and powers are not of our own doing. But again, some similar considerations are relevant here. Um, the given can often involve some very bad things. So the COVID-19 pandemic is part of the given. Uh, that doesn't necessarily mean we have to be passive in response to it. Um, we can, of course, do things to mitigate the bad aspects of the given. And it's also not obviously clear that the decision to enhance yourself must always be motivated by an attitude of mastery. So suppose you have a surgeon coming to the end of a long shift who learns that a child has been rushed into his department in need of life-saving surgery. If he decides to take a pill to ensure his concentration for that surgery, it seems quite perverse to suggest that he is doing so from an attitude of mastery. The final one, um, we might worry that the use of enhancement undermines the value of our achievements. Um, 
violates the deep structure of natural human activity, says Leon Cass. This seems to have an element of truth. Um, so we think about athletes who use doping substances in sports, we might think they no longer deserve their medals. Um, and that seems true. But of course, different enhancements can have different implications for how much we are contributing to our actions. Some, action, uh, some enhancements have trade-offs, so they might improve some of your abilities whilst weakening others. And even people who take doping substances in sport may have to train to really reap the full rewards. And also the context matters. So imagine a professional music, musician using a beta blocker to steady their hand to perform a virtuoso piece. The use of that enhancement doesn't necessarily undermine the huge amount of skill they exhibit in that performance. In contrast, the use of a calculator in a mental maths exam really undermines the point of the exercise. So context matters. Um, and these examples mean, I think, that we need to have much deeper reflection on what it is that we value and different kinds of activity and what enhancements are contributing to them. So that really is a, a whistle stop tour of some of the key ethical issues in enhancement. And I'll open up now for a bit of a broader discussion.